Welcome to our home. We're so pleased to have you with us today as we continue our study of the Book of Mormon together. Today we're going to be studying Mosiah chapters 11 through 17. We're going to be looking specifically at the heart. In three main topics, we're going to be studying desires of the heart, educating the desires of the heart, and then being unified in our hearts. We're excited to have you with us and invite you to join with us in our study of the Book of Mormon. Welcome to Grounded, where women of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds gather together with me, Barbara Morgan Gardner, and my guest, as we strive to build a bedrock understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and become more like Him. We are so excited to be able to discuss these scriptures with our wonderful friend, Jan Martin. Jan, we've known each other for a number of years and, we have. and had a wonderful time studying scriptures together. President Nelson, over the years, has reminded us that we are children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Christ. So beyond that identity, what would you tell us about yourself to get us help us to get to know you a little bit better? Um, well, I would say that I am just someone who's always loved the scriptures. Weirdly, I'm one of those kind of scripture nerd people. Um, I love being outside, and I love nature, and I love being active. I'm real interested in um, just taking care of myself and, and trying to be as fit and happy and healthy as possible. So, yeah. Jan, can you, thank you, can you tell us, and actually I know that I played with you at volleyball yeah, and things, yeah. and you're, you're something else. I'm a volleyball fan, it's true. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Jan, will you yeah. tell us about your, kind of just, just your background in education and, yeah. and also in your employment? Just what have you... Okay. Who are you? That, in, that, in that way, yeah. yeah. So I started out at a uh, university in physical education, so the sport thing, and was going to be a coach, and then just kind of got some other revelation that, that the high school thing was just not for me, and mm. so went and got an exercise physiology master's degree so I could be a coach. I was going to be a oh, university wow. coach. And then again, the Lord had other ideas, which we all know sometimes he has other plans for us, and so I ended up becoming a seminary teacher. Wow. And so you and I can connect on that one. Yeah, we can. Um, did that for about six years around Utah County. And then again, another piece of revelation came of, I need you to get prepared to teach university level. Wow. So I quit uh, teaching seminary, moved to England, and did a whole second round of another master's and a, and a PhD in uh, 16th century English Bible translation. So Wow. Yeah. And so then got a job at BYU, and here we are. And so, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun to teach together at BYU. Yeah, Wonderful student, great opportunities and things. Yeah. And to have that training and yeah. teaching the gospel yeah. for both of us, too. Yeah. Okay. And what about family? Can you tell us a little bit about family for you? Yeah, I'm uh, one of uh, five children. I'm the only girl, so surrounded by boys. And that kind of helped me in my career because I've been surrounded by men largely in yeah. my career. So. Um, and then I got married when I was over in England, so I have this cute British husband who's very special, and uh, he has six children from a previous marriage, and so we've we've got our hands full with all those fun things. Wow, so, a yeah. lot going on, huh, Jen? Yeah. It's amazing mm -hmm. what the Lord will do with I our know. lives, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Nothing I would have planned any of these things, actually. So. And, in, and in reality, Jan, we have so many people, women especially, listening to this podcast, and men as well. And I think that's something that's become almost a theme, in a mm -hmm. sense, is I think all of us can say that we have placed our life in God's hands, mm -hmm. or at least the majority, and, and he has done something yeah. very different with us than we thought. Than we thought. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. kind of fun to be at this stage looking back and saying, and thank goodness, most of the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> thank yes. goodness. Thank goodness so. he's got it. And and thank goodness we're open to inspiration yes. to, to follow it. Yep. You know, you don't have to. And that's kind of some things we're going to talk about today is how do you handle that with um, desiring something other than what God wants. But, you know, in, in my experience, at least, it's always been the wiser choice to yes. go with what God wants. It's, it's, it's President Nelson talking about how God will not always give us what we want, but what we need in order yes. to become what he wants us and knows we can yeah. become, right? Exactly, yeah. It's so. easy to look back in a sense, but also recognizing that even now where we are, there are things that we may be wanting mm -hmm. that may not be exactly what is best for us, yeah. or, and then learning how to deal with that. Yeah, exactly. But Jan, that really brings us into this first topic of discussion. It's the desire of our heart. Yeah. So can you just take that again? We're in Mosiah 11 yeah. through 17. So Mosiah 11 through 17, fabulous section. Uh, we obviously, a lot of us know that Abinadi comes into this and there's so much storyline, so much drama, so much doctrine being taught. 
And so as I was looking and reading through these chapters, just trying to decide what you and I could talk about that was maybe a little different than uh, what we would normally talk about. Yeah. It just started standing out to me that in chapters 11 through 13, the word heart appear- appears 12 times. Wow. Yeah. And so it just started standing out to me that, that this is a theme. If you come in chapter 11 of Messiah to verse 2, this is our first instance of the word heart, and it's about King Noah. And as we're looking at this, we find out that he is not going to keep the commandments of God. And in our kind of third line into the verse, it says he did walk after the desires of his own heart. Now, because we know in Hebrew that we're looking at the will, just look at what happens when we read it that way. But he did walk after de- after the desires of his own will. So now we're setting the stage for this battle between my will and God's will or somebody else's will. And I think this is a, a great topic for us to start looking at is how, how we see King Noah and his people um, kind of going up against God and being unwilling to learn or accept of God's will um, because they're asserting their own will. So if we turn the page over... And you come to chapter 11, verse 5. Again, you watch uh, King Noah choosing people who have a particular way of looking at things. And it says here that he puts down all the priests that have been consecrated by his father, and he consecrates new ones, such as were lifted up in the pride of their hearts or in the pride of their own will. Mm. And so we're now having a, a religious system that's not based anymore on what God wants or what God is teaching, but it's about how I want the scriptures to be uh, interpreted or how I think something should be done. And King Noah is surrounding himself with people who aren't really interested in what God wants anymore. And, he, and it looks like, it looks yeah. as if he also wants people to to not only agree with him, but to support him. Yeah. I mean, you look at verse four and yep. all this he did to, to support himself yes, and his exactly. wife and his concubines. He doesn't want somebody saying, you probably shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Or have you considered like, what God may yeah, think about like, that? That's like, not really... <laughs> he doesn't want any, he doesn't nope. want to be uncomfortable at all. So no. bring people close to him that's, that are going to agree yep. with him and and in a sense, fortify yes. his will. Yes, exactly. And let's, let's shore up this worldly way of looking at things. Yep. If you jump across the column into verse 14, you'll see another one of these verses where that heart is mentioned. And it says here that Noah placed his heart, or we could say will, upon his riches. Mm. So again, we just have this, what is really important to Noah? Nothing about God is important. It's about me. It's about my money. It's about my party life. You see in the rest of that verse, we have riotous living going on. The priests are joining in. And it's about how I want to treat other people. And he's not necessarily treating his wives or any of the other women in his circle particularly well there either. And so you just start to get a feel for this society. It's all about me. It's all about self. It's all about the natural man will. And God is kind of being squeezed out. So, of course, you have the Lord looking down going, um, no, yeah, I'm not okay with any of this. Let me send a prophet. And then we hit verse 20. And then we have Abinadi coming into here to teach that none of this is okay. And that the Lord is, is at the end of verse 20, going to visit these people in his anger if they don't turn things around and start caring what God thinks and start treating each other better. And, you know, Jan, we I recognize not all of this is is focused simply on what is happening to the women, but we we do know from other scriptures, you know, Jacob, we stated that not too long ago, yeah. that the Lord is very concerned about yes. how the women are being treated. Yes, he is. And we see that in prophets today. I mean, and there's a, the great quote from President Nelson. I mean, mm-hmm. the great quote from President Monson where he says, beware lest you make a woman cry for God counts her every tear. Yep. I think it goes with men as well, but we have a prophet now that's being called, the Lord is not okay with how his people no. are being treated. And I would say in this case, he's very concerned about the women. Yeah. And, and I love connecting this chapter back to Jacob because Jacob is where this concubinage system was trying to be introduced with the Nephites earlier. Yeah. And the Lord comes in and shuts that down. Like there's no question the Heavenly Father was unhappy about that. And Jacob, you know, very boldly but now you have this new little colony so that snuck away from Zarahemla, and now they're down here doing their own thing, and they're going back to something God was adamantly resisting. I don't want this. 
And so, of course, Abinadi is here for lots of reasons. But I'd agree with you that one of them is the women are being treated poorly and God has something to say yeah. about it, for sure. Yeah. And so we bring that in there. And then if you come over to just your other column again to verse 29, after Abinadi is taught that they need to repent, you watch what the people do. They are blinded. And therefore, they harden their hearts. And I just want to throw in that word will again. They harden their will against the words of the Lord and against Abinadi. And so they're hearing it. It's pretty clear something needs to happen. But instead of humbly responding, I'm going to resist. And I'm going to push back against what I'm hearing and carry on in my own way. Yeah. And it seems from this, Jan, I mean, we have that word harden here twice, yep, right? It's yep. interesting that not, not only are they hardening their hearts yep. and hardening their wills, but now it seems that there's a lot of anger going on. Yep. It seems that we're seeing a, a, an angry King Noah. So mm -hmm. it's not just mm -hmm. don't get in my way, but now yeah. Abinadi seems to be pushing hard enough that he's saying, okay, now I'm ticked off. Yeah. Right? You're making me mad. I don't like it when you're telling me that what I want isn't right. Yeah. And we've all had that kind of natural man response before. We can all relate to that. Wait a second. You've made me mad because you're telling me something I don't want to hear. And so I'm going to push back against you and I'm going to use some some violent feelings and maybe some violent language to, to let you know that yeah. I'm not happy about this. So, of course, you hit chapter 12 and Abinadi is has gone he's been away for a couple of years waiting hoping people are going to repent and they don't and so he's sent back again and again this is just a lovely testament to the lord and how often he reaches for us <laughs> yeah he's not just going to send a prophet one time he sends him back the second time and again we have this message of repent repent and you look in 12 verse 1 the reason the lord sends him back is they have hardened their hearts or their will against my words. For two years, I've patiently waited to see if they're going to change. And it's just getting worse. So, Abinadi, I need you to go back again and turn up the heat and see if we can get some some hearts to soften and something to, to change. It's interesting that he takes such a humble man mm -hmm. who is willing to submit his will to the I Father know. at such a strong, obvious level that we're going to see here. And yeah. he's the one that the Lord is using to help other people have a soft heart. Yes, and you just I love Abinadi. He's such a courageous guy, but you can see the humility and the um willingness to do a hard thing, but then to be bold and not be apologetic. His words, you know, when you read two, three, and four of chapter twelve, it doesn't get any bolder than this. Right. I'm gonna smite these people. They're gonna have famines and pestilences and afflictions. I need you to turn this ship around. It's not heading in a good direction, and we're not gonna mince any words about that. So then, as we know the story, Abinadi is picked up by the people. And, and, of course, they turn him over to Noah. And then if you look in verse 17, Abinadi is cast into prison. And, and then we have this um, trial going on that's really fun. And, and we don't have time to go into all the detail of the trial. But one of my favorite things to point out is that Abinadi just takes over the trial. Yes. He goes in the prosecutorial mode. And he does all the questioning. And he's so brilliant that he's able, as a prisoner, to take over the court and you just got to appreciate that but but anyway one of the things he says if we want to all jump over to verse 27 I, I, this is one of my all-time favorites yeah. of the story it's yeah. so good and he says are you priests and pretend to teach this people and understand the spirit of prophesying and yet desire to know of me what these things mean and, you know, talk about a humbling moment there. Yeah. <laughs> like, really? And then we jump down to verse 27. Ye have not applied your heart, and we can throw in will, to understanding. Therefore, ye have not been wise. Now, we have some great stuff from Elder Bednar. We do. He did some great teachings on this, and I'm happy to let you uh, help us with that if you'd like to, because he, uh, great devotional he gave many years ago about, about, what does it mean to help our hearts understand? In fact, Jan, when I teach this often with my students, I will talk to them about, I don't want you just to understand in your mind. I right. need true understanding when it's associated with the gospel of Jesus Christ as a matter of the heart. Yeah. And then I also love in this verse where he says, therefore you have not been wise. 
wisdom comes from applying the understanding that the Holy Ghost has yes. fortified in your own heart. That's so right. he's actually teaching that principle very well. Yeah. Mentally, they probably had a pretty idea, pretty uh -huh. good idea of what the law of Moses was. But yes. they were not obeying it. Their hearts were not in it. Nope. And because of that, they actually were not wise yep. because they weren't applying yep. it. So yeah. this is here's here's an elder Bednar. And I, I do love this quote. It's exactly what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. He says, I find it most interesting in these and many other verses. And he's referring to... Uh, Mosiah chapter 12, verse 27. Right. Yeah. He also ties it to 35, 1933. Just, just yeah. so you know, if you want to look that up at home. But he says, I find it most interesting in these and many other verses that understanding is linked primarily, primarily to the heart. Yep. Note that we are not explicitly counseled to apply our minds to understanding. Obviously, we must use our minds and our rational capacity to obtain and evaluate information and to reach appropriate conclusions and judgments. Then he continues, but perhaps the scriptures are suggesting to us that the reason, yes. sorry, to us that reason and the arm of flesh are not sufficient to produce true understanding. Thus, understanding, as the word is used in the scriptures, does not refer solely or even primarily to intellectual or cognitive comprehension. Right. Rather, understanding occurs when what we know in our mind is confirmed as true in our hearts by the witness of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That is powerful. Yeah. There is a difference. I think all of us can yeah. understand this, that there is a difference when we have applied our heart to understanding versus yep. we've applied our mind to knowledge. And mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned this. I think what you are doing here and showing us here, Jen, is so important that this is this is a different definition that you're going to find in the Webster's Dictionary, yes. right? Sometimes, especially when we're looking at the scriptures and trying to understand how God is teaching, we have to use God's definition. Yeah. We have to use God's context of the scriptures to say, wait a second, when the Lord is asking us to help our children, teach them to understand, we need to be teaching our children need to, it would be helpful if we would teach our children to understand and understand the spirit and understand the Holy Ghost and understand how that works yeah. more than making sure they understand facts and information. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that takes us, you just mentioned to 29, that's next time. Why do you set your heart so much upon these riches? Yes. Right. Yeah. Instead of on people, like yeah. what's important to you is yourself and your riches and, and you're not actually looking around and seeing what is being made out of this society that's so focused on possessions and money and, and the the tragedies and the pain and the, the being used and being walked all over, like they're missing that whole side of society because I'm looking so much at, at wealth and things. It, it, again, it's the idea of that we've been taught, and it's in a few places in the scriptures, that where your treasure is, there will your heart yeah, be also. Exactly. If you treasure souls, and that's, you know, God's work and glory, as we know this, is to bring to pass the, the immortality, eternal life of his children. It's, yeah. it's Elder Holland saying, you know, everything that you have is going to be left here, that's except right. for your heart, yeah. your will, what you've yeah. given to the Lord, right? So let's use Elder Maxwell now oh, that please. you just brought yeah. that up. Um, he is someone who had a huge influence on me growing up. He's so doctrinally deep, yeah, but he, he, he made some some quotes that a lot of you out there will know. Um, but he says here, I'm going to teach a hard doctrine to you now. And he says the submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. It is a hard doctrine, but it's true. And then he goes through and says all the other things we have actually are gods and they were given to us and so when we give those back um, he says that's really nice to give those back but they were always gods to begin with and so there's not as much in that gift as there could be so then he says the part of us that is ultimately sovereign the mind and the heart where we really do decide which way to go and what to do and when we submit to his will then we've really given him the one final thing he asks of us. And it's the only possession we have that is really ours to give. And so, wow, you're looking at these people and they're really struggling with this concept of submitting to God's will. And then you watch how they end up treating other people and being hard-hearted and not compassionate or understanding of other people's lives. And oh my goodness. And the way to turn that around then is to go back and say, okay, who do I need to start submitting to? God and to the stories and experiences of others. And let's start working out how to be good people. Yeah. And you know, Jen, this is this is really hard. And I, it, I clearly it's been something that's been going on for years and years and years. But I, I, I think much of this we see in our day, um, it's this idea of what do I want and my will versus the Lord's mm -hmm. will? Yeah. And I think, you know, there have been times in my life, you know, 
we can both speak to this yes, so we can. many times. We can. But I think of what I consider unfair, right? Yeah. And I, how many times in my life is it on? It's it's unfair that all of my roommates got married before I did. It's yep. unfair that all these people have. It's unfair that they have this. And it's unfair. And and, it, and the problem with unfairness is what what I'm really saying is, I'm an entitled person, and God hasn't given me what I want. Exactly. It's my will versus His. And sometimes mm -hmm. we think even the most righteous desires, yep. e even in my desire to to be married to and be have a family, and have a family. Or, yeah, or whatever it yeah. is, my righteous desire to be. A Relief Society, but my righteous desire to have a calling, whatever it is, when I'm comparing somebody to myself to somebody else, or when I'm telling God it's unfair, what I'm really saying is my will is not aligned with your will, and I am an entitled person. It's yeah. hard to accept that it that is. is reality, it is. but that is what's going on. So, but that's lacking yes, at this moment. At this moment. But not lacking in Abinadi. No. But lacking in others. Abinadi the, is this. He's well, the, the opposite. Whole thing, the whole reason he's there is not for him. Right. You know, if he had his way, he'd probably be wherever he came from, enjoying a nice life and not having to be threatened and not having to be put on trial and not ultimately having to lose his life here. So... He's here for the benefit of everyone else. Yes. And he's such a stark contrast to uh, what's going on here. So if we want to now, um, we have this great moment in chapter 13 where Abinadi's life is threatened. And we all know that he boldly says, touch me not. And <laughs> I've not delivered my message. And then carries on delivering the message. Uh, but what I'd like to do for just a minute is jump over to chapter 14, because then he quotes some of the most beautiful passages of Isaiah about the Savior and how much the Savior has to offer us because he put God's will first mm -hmm. and put us first. So that's what we've been talking about this Powerful. whole time is this selfishness. And then I forget about God and I forget about other people. But here's a person who came to earth not for himself, but to do the will of his father and to rescue the rest of his brothers and sisters. And so chapter 14, the descriptions of this Jesus that Abinadi is trying to introduce them to, that he's going to grow up without any of this worldly attractiveness or wealth or whatever that these people find important. But Jesus is going to be the opposite of that. There's no beauty that we should desire him. That's verse 2 of chapter 14. And then you look at this. He's the opposite of this society. He's despised. So he's more of an Abinadi and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him because he was despised and we esteemed him not. We're putting this worldly lens on, on what matters. And so here's this Abinadi who's, who's shackled and who's being persecuted, testifying of the most selfless individual that's ever been on this planet, trying and hoping that some of this is going to soften some hearts in the room. He's wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Talk about selflessness. Yeah. You know, he didn't even do any of the things that I did. And he's taking the beating for all of them. Yeah, in verse 9, he says, <sighs> yeah, he has done no evil, yep. right? I mean, yep. yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and, yeah. and hath put him to grief. You know, and, and this kind of introduces us into the, to our next point of educating our desires to the point where we start understanding why submitting to the Lord's will is better. Yeah. So you look at that verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him because he was going to save the rest of humanity. Yes. So we have to have a Savior who's willing to do this for the whole plan to work. But for someone to be selfish and say, well, I'm sorry, now that I'm down here, I don't really want to do <laughs> Come that. Come to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> that hurts. You know, so, yeah. so this education for the Savior of him fully understanding why he came and then being willing to go through it introduces us to this idea of how do I educate my own desires so they're more likely to come into alignment with yeah. God's will. Yeah, when I mean, we've done that, I think we were showing yeah. that there's this, this is a group of people in that first topic that they the desires of their hearts are are on the things of the world and its selfishness. Yeah. But then we're comparing that specifically to Abinadi and mm -hmm. now we're comparing it to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now the question is how do we educate our hearts? Yeah. And that's yeah. I think you're going to take us there yes, maybe a little under yeah, Maxwell would, or scriptures. As well, we've got some people too to, yeah, to take us. help us. 
Um, but first thing, I've got a comment from Elder F. Enzio Busha from the, the Quorum of the Seventy, and this was from 1996, so it's a little bit old, but I like it because it's so detailed. And so he just says, first place we have to start is become aware of the multiple undefined and defined conscious and subconscious desires that we have. And we have to learn to bring all these up to our awareness and start analyzing them, categorizing them, and then figuring out how to prioritize them. We're just kind of a mass yeah. of desire, aren't we? Absolutely. And sometimes we just don't stop and analyze and look, what is it that I really want? What is it that I'm after here? Who am I? And then he says, there are always hundreds of different desires fighting for supremacy within us. The act of categorizing them is very painful but needful. In the eyes of God, we need to become mature people and we need to be taken seriously. But if we don't know much about ourselves, it's hard to be taken seriously. Especially if we have a hard heart and we're not letting people yeah. tell us about ourselves. Yeah. And so he says what we have to really learn to do is for this real part of us, the real self, the real spirit that's in us to, to really become somebody that we start to know and have the Lord coming in and educating us about ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but in my long journey of trying to get married and things, I suddenly started to realize that getting down on my knees and saying, Dear Heavenly Father, help me find a husband, just really wasn't very effective. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> um, I actually had to start figuring out who I was and what type of a husband that I would like to find, what kind of a person did I think would be a good feel for me. And then that then brings up all my things and my weaknesses and my issues and my stuff. And suddenly there's this education process going on that my immature self just wanted a husband on the doorstep. Right. But my more maturing self was starting to realize, oh, God actually wants me to start figuring this out and learn from my experiences so that my desires for a husband, and this is Elder Maxwell, by educating and training our desires, they become our allies instead of our enemies. Oh, that's good. And I think sometimes we're our own worst enemy because we haven't done this internal work to figure things out and God wants us to. Yeah. And as I do that, then my desires can actually become helpful instead of causing problems for me. So looks like you've got some. Well, I was going to share something yeah. with you. That, uh, this is, uh, I'm thinking about what you're talking about and desiring and educating the desires yeah. of your heart. And it reminds me of many times in the Book of Mormon, we are told, and even Nephi does this at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, he's counseling with the Lord, yeah. or he's praying with the yeah. Lord and not at the Lord, right? And right. I think sometimes we could just say, is my prayer, I mean, as many people have said this, is it a shopping list or am I counseling are with God? Are we actually God? having a conversation? Yes. Yeah. yes. And and I, you know, part of that is what you're talking about, spiritual maturity, mm -hmm. but part of it is also a, a level of meekness that is very hard to obtain. It and is. I am still working on that, yeah. will be forever, I'm sure. But this is, this is Alma 37, and I... These verses, I think, are extremely important, specifically in the context of counseling. Right. So he says, oh, remember, this is verse 35, remember my son and learn wisdom. Again, that word wisdom, mm -hmm. right? The application. Yep. And thy youth, yea, learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. Cry unto God for all thy support. Let all thy doings be unto the Lord. And whithersoever thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Again, all of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to keep reading this. Yea, yeah. Let all of thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Let the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. I mean, you're talking about dating and things. And it's not just <laughs> dating, but it's children. It's yes. life. It's job. It's work. Yes. It's 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 activity levels of people that we love. And yeah. I mean, we could list and list. It's cancer. It's 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 finances. It's yeah. everything that, that seems to matter to us in mortality. Right. Put that on... I, I just love, let the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. In, in, in another set of scriptures, I actually have names of all the people that I seriously dated, uh -huh, right? And uh -huh. <laughs> I place that name on the Lord. I place yes. that on the altar of the Lord. I place that for that thing. I, uh -huh. I just kept placing things. But then verse 37, counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. When thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord that he may watch over you in your sleep. When thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. If you do these things, you shall be lifted up at that last day. And for me, this has been kind of an education. Mm -hmm. These verses mm -hmm. are an educating yes, verse, desires I that I am counseling, talking, thinking through, going to bed at night, waking uh -huh. up in the morning. And I'm. I, I, you learn yeah. after a while that my will is not necessarily God's will. And no. in order to align my will with his, 
I need I to be need educated, to be educated. And so I have yes, to counsel with him. You do. And so um, Joseph F. Smith said, the education of our desires is one of far-reaching importance to our happiness in life. And then he talks about God's ways of educating our desires yeah. tends to be through the spirit, but also through experience. And so, you know, for me to sit there at an 18 year old and say, can you just put some guy on my porch and let me have a nice, happy marriage and not have any thought or any effort or anything is a little immature. Yeah. But over the years, I was like, oh, <laughs> God actually wants me to be a participant in this figure out who I am, figure out who these other people are, and then start counseling with him to see if this is a good choice and this is not a good choice and make some some decisions instead of just treating him like he's the grocery clerk and he's just going to pick someone right. and bring him along. But that education process that I received about that and many other things about careers and about family and about where to live, all of that has helped me mature and then understand who I am and what I want. And then when I bring it to God, there's actually something to counsel about. And then I can have God, you know, tell me more things that he knows beyond that. And then I can be like, okay, well, you know, your perspective is higher than mine. So of course I want to listen to what you're offering and then come around to see things from your point of view, but it's a process. Let's bring it into our topic of the reason we're educating our desires is to bring everything in alignment with God's will. And once we're in unity, then we can move forward in, in power and strength. Yeah. So let me just um, have everyone come to chapter 15, 1 through 4. And I'll just give the key that I use yep. to help my students understand what's going on here and not misunderstand. And the key, in my opinion, to these verses is verse 1. And so it says, And now Abinadi said unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. Now, because we are who we are, we read verse 1 as God, Heavenly Father, shall come down and redeem the children of men. And then we get all confused after that. And verses 2, 3, and 4 just sound like something they're not. Yeah. But if we remember that the people of the Book of Mormon worship Jehovah, of the Old Testament, that their God is Jehovah. And all the way through the Book of Mormon, the God they're referring to is largely Jehovah. Who and is Jesus Christ. Who is right? Jesus Christ. Right. And so now we can read verse 1 from a Nephite, Abinadi understanding, and realize that he's saying that you should understand that Jehovah himself, or Jesus Christ, shall come down among his people among the children of men, and shall redeem his people. We know this. We know Jesus Christ is a redeemer, not Heavenly Father. Even though it's Heavenly Father's plan, Heavenly Father's up there, and he doesn't come down here and redeem us. And so we have Jesus Christ coming to redeem his people. And because Christ dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. Of course, because he got his own body. You know, that's what sons do. They're born and they have their own body. And then having subjected the flesh, this is what we've been talking about the whole time, this will of the flesh, the flesh to the will of the father. Now he is unified as the father and the son. And so then we move to verse three. He's the father because Christ was conceived by the power of God. We know he had a miraculous conception that God transferred his power to him in that conception. But he's the son because of the flesh. He has his own body thus becoming the Father and the Son because of the submission of wills. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. So suddenly these verses are not even remotely Trinitarian. No, they're not even confusing not when even you look at it that way. Not even confusing at all. Yeah. It's all about learning the submission of Jesus Christ to his heavenly Father and how in the submission they become one. They can then act in the same ways, have the same power, do the same things, and it doesn't matter which one of them is there or not. And this is the reason that we need to be conscious of our desires, educate our desires in God's direction so that we can achieve this unity with our uh, Savior and with our God. Now, I teach the New Testament sometimes at BYU, and so... Whenever I look at these verses in chapter 15, it makes me think of the intercessory prayer in chapter oh, of 17 course. of John. Yeah. And so I just want to remind our audience that Jesus Christ, before he uh, completed the atonement, gave this beautiful intercessory prayer all about having his followers become one with him as he is one in the Father. And of course, we're not making everybody blending into one body there. 
we're just having this concept of unity. And so in the intercessory prayer, Jesus starts with, I want, I'm praying to you that you keep my disciples whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So we've just learned from Abinadi how they are one, and it's all about submission of will and submission of our, our desires to God. And then if we carry on, we see here in verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast seen me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So the education of our desires, as Abinadi's bring in this whole sermon about Christ around to the end, is we're trying to get all of you to learn to give up your will, to understand your will and bring in alignment with God so that you can be one with them and then serve and love in the way that they would. And how inspiring is that? Well, you know? yeah. And Jan, mm -hmm. if you keep going with those verses in Mosiah 15, yeah. which then you see even, you see the difficulty, yes. a different kind of difficulty. I think with Christ, the difficulty yeah. was that he was now mortal. Yep. And us, it's trying to turn our will to the Father. It seems that Christ already had his will turned mm -hmm. to the Father. I don't know how mm -hmm. that works exactly. But still, it's an effort and it's still very difficult. Yes. And I, in verse 5, yeah. Five through seven, really, he sees, we, we see this. And thus the flesh becoming subject to the spirit or the son of the son to the father being one God suffereth temptation, mm -hmm. yieldeth not to the temptation. So this is how he's becoming, suffereth himself to be mocked, scourged, cast out, disowned by his people. Mm -hmm. And after all this, after working many mighty miracles among the children of men, he shall be led, yea, even Isaiah, Isaiah said, as a sheep before the shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Yea, even so he shall be led, crucified, and slain, the flesh becoming subject even until death, unto death. The will of the Son, and there's that will again, mm -hmm. right? The yeah. will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father. And thus God breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death, giving the Son power to make intercession for the children of men. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 8, we see that he's filled with this compassion yeah. and this mercy. And then I also love verse 11, when you're talking about becoming one. Yeah. The most selfless thing is after uh -huh. Christ does all this, and he yeah. is the only one who could. And what does he want? He wants, as it says at the end of verse 11, that they are the heirs of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So he has absolutely sacrificed everything, put yeah. everything on the plate. Everything's on the line. He has suffered. He has been absolutely mocked, disowned, scourged, and everything. And then what does he give to us? Yep. Everything back. Everything back. He just wants to make yep. us heirs with him. Yep. It's never about him. Yeah. It's always about the father first and us second. And so you have him living in such depth, the first two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. And the second, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And you see him here. He's this amazing mediator between us and God. But those first two commandments are right there. My first priority is God. And because I keep my first priority, then I know how to relate to my second priority, which is people. And I'm just not in this picture. Yep. You know? So selfless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can we take this back for a moment to Abinadi? Yeah. At the end of his life, then yep. we're seeing like chapter 16, especially, yes. he's continuing to testify of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he has this, you know, he's received his errand of the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, and, and now he's saying, you know, that everyone at some point is going to see eye to eye. And we know that every tongue will confess and, yep. and every knee will bow. Yep. And verse two, he says, and then shall the wicked be cast out. You know, he kind of goes through this whole thing. And this is, he's being told to say this. It's not yes. like he's saying, nope. let me tell you something because I want to make you feel yeah, really bad. No. He is like, on, is reality. Yes, he's on the errand of yeah. the Lord. This is something that he has been asked to say. And sometimes, just as the prophets have said today, it's not that they want to say these things, but the Lord has told them to say, to these, say things. these things. And so they say it according yeah. to them. And then he testifies of Christ. He is the light, the life of the world, mm -hmm. a light that is endless and can mm -hmm. never be darkened. You know, I think this is interesting as he's going to talk about he's going to be be burned at yes, the stake. And he's talking about this light of Christ. Mm -hmm. Then he's just almost pleading with them, teach the truth. And then verse 15, teach them that the redemption yep. cometh through Christ the Lord, who was the very eternal father. Even yeah. at the end of his life here, he's 
pleading with them. Yeah. Give up your carnal will. Yes. Focus on the Savior. Teach your children. Teach yes. everyone that Jesus is the Christ. Yeah, and you've done this brilliant job walking us through 16. But I just want to point out to our audience, verse 2 at the end of it says, they would not. Oh, There's yeah. the will. Verse 12, right at the end, there's three times. They would not, they were warned, they would not depart, yet they would not repent. And so this this whole concept we've had all the way through here is it just right back to, it's all about your will. Yes. You guys, I've taught you this brilliant stuff. You have this Savior who's done everything for you. But the linchpin is your will. Are you going to soften? Are you going to let God's will become your will? Are you going to educate your desires and appreciate the atonement that you've been given or not? Yep. But it's your choice. And there we leave it. And then you have chapter 17 with Alma, <laughs> yay, yes. who's the only one in the group who allows his heart to be softened and who makes that key will choice, I will repent. I'm going to defend Abinadi. I am going to make things right. And we have that. But as we know, poor Abinadi, um, as a type of Christ, the death is not the same as Christ, but you cannot not see the similarity here. Right. I'm going to go as a lamb to the slaughter. And if you take my life, then I will testify by showing you that I'm going to submit to God's will. Even this I will do in hopes that somebody here is going to turn around and change, and he loses his life uh, in testifying of what he said. But wow, Jan, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic study, and thank you for helping us go through these scriptures, yeah. 11 through 17. There is so much there in the book of Mosiah. Mm. And thank you also for sharing these quotes yeah. and your insights and experiences. We like to end with the with the final question, yeah. and it's just the Book of Mormon. It is, it is how has the Book of Mormon changed your life, Jan? <laughs> I know that's like, the big how do you question. Even answer right? that yep. question. Um, I I will just share with you uh, the very first memory that I have of a spiritual experience, and it is with the Book of Mormon. So my parents, like many parents, tried to read the scriptures mm -hmm. with their kids, and we all know how successful that is and how periodic it often is. But this was one of those times where they were trying to do that every night with us, and I was probably five. Wow! Um, because I was learning to read. And so it was quite exciting to sit on my dad's knee and then have this book open. And I can still see in my mind's eye his big adult finger going under the lines. And here I am as this five-year-old um, little girl trying to sound out. And I can still remember the sounding out of the big words and, and reading along with my dad. I was five. I don't remember a thing that I was <laughs> reading. I don't know what verse it was. I don't know where it was. But I was filled with a realization that whatever this was, it was good for me. And I had a hunger for it. And I became a student of the Book of Mormon from that point on. As I told you, I'm a bit of a scripture geek and I love scripture and I love the Book of Mormon especially. But how does that happen for a five-year-old? To be given a witness that this text is true, even when you cannot even understand one yep. single word. But it wasn't about the words. It was about being in the text. It was about following our leaders. It was about submitting to an activity and being open to the Spirit. And so the Book of Mormon from that moment on changed my life. And every time I needed comfort, every time I needed answers, every time I've needed something since then, I've had this feeling that this book tastes good to me. It's good for my soul. And that came at the beginning with a five-year-old. And I'm so grateful for this book. I've spent hours and hours in it. It's such an honor to be someone who teaches it on a regular basis. But from an age of a five-year-old, changed my life and I'm so grateful for my parents in that little moment trying to do the right thing with a bunch of little kids running around and opening me up to the power of the scriptures and changed my life. So, Thank you, Jan. Yeah. 
President Eyring has a quote where he says, the Book of Mormon is not on trial. We are. Mm-hmm. And I remember that often yeah. as I think about this, that it's us, how we apply the scriptures and how we learn and what we do with our lives. And in this case, thank you for helping us to to think about our hearts mm-hmm. and also to remind us that we can educate our hearts, that the Lord can educate our yes. hearts. We aren't always, the natural man isn't, we're not stuck there. The mm-hmm. Lord can help us in this process. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much. And we are going to see that in the future with Alma, yeah. as his heart is now going to be changed and the impact he has. Yeah. We would like to thank all of you for joining with us on Grounded Today. And thank you, Jen, for joining with us as well. We, we just love getting into these scriptures. We hope that you have enjoyed reading your scriptures and studying these scriptures with us. And we also hope that you feel the love of God for you and that you have felt and continue to feel the guidance of the Holy Ghost in your life. We invite you to look into your own heart and determine where you are and your willingness and your desire to submit your will to the Father's. We also invite you to share this podcast with others as you feel the desire to do so, that we can help other people come in a sense to our home, join us at the table as we try to fill each other and fill others with this great joy that the scriptures have brought to us. So we'll see you next week on Grounded.